So, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all for today's e conference on navigating the path to net zero in the chemicals industry, organized by Indian Chemical News, India's number one portal on chemicals, petrochemicals, and energy sector. The conference is supported by Snyder Electric, the global leader in digital transformation of energy management and next gen automation. Let me introduce you with our esteemed speaker for today's e-conference. We have Mr. Girish Satarkar, Executive Director, Deepak Nitrite Limited. He has over 34 years of experience in the chemical industry, out of which 16 years in leadership position. He is proficient in business affairs with hands-on experience of managing operations and has a good understanding of risk management and corporate governance. He is a strategist with an eye for identifying new business opportunities. And here, the focus would be on net zero and sustainability. Thank you, sir, for joining uh, uh, from, uh, from Baroda. Uh, thank you, Mr. Praveen. It's my pleasure and, and, and an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Mr. K.K. Sharma, whole time director EHS, DCM Sriram Limited. He has more than 34 years of experience in agrochemicals and pharmaceutical companies in manufacturing and EHS which is Environment, Health and Safety. He has worked with Garda Chemicals, Ranbaxi, Jubilant and Syngenta. He is presently driving ESG initiatives and reporting of ESG performance in the sustainability report as per global reporting initiative standards. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Praveen. Pleasure to be part of this discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Mirtunje Chaube, uh, Global Vice President Environment and Sustainability, UPL Limited. Dr. Chaube is Sustainability, Environment and Water Expert of International Repute. He has 27 years of working experience in renowned MNCs like Pentair, Shell and Unilever. Recently, Mr. Chaube was elected as a Governing Council member of United Nations Global Compact Network India. And this was also an honor for all of us. Uh, congratulations, sir. He is author of Wastewater Treatment, Technologies, Design Considerations, published by Willie Publishers USA. Thank you, sir, for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Praveen. It's an honor as well as pleasure for me to be part of this panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gianluca Marola, Global Business Development for Speciality Chemicals, Snyder Electric. He has more than 25 years of experience in speciality chemical sector both in startup and corporate domains. In Snyder, Gianluca leads the speciality chemical segment and growth strategies. Over the course of his career, Gianluca has been living in France, UK, Netherlands, Singapore. Presently, he has joined from Switzerland. Welcome, sir. Thanks a lot, Mr. Prashant. My pleasure to be part of this very interesting audience. Mr. Venkat Garimela. Uh, Vice President Strategy and Sustainability, Snyder Electric India, a prolific business leader with 26 years of experience in running and managing businesses across domains and, and, and customer segment of which 18 years with Snyder Electric. Currently leading corporate strategy and sustainability for Snyder India with focus on future-proving businesses, incubating ideas, championing energy efficiency and sustainable development vision of Snyder Electric. Welcome, uh, Mr. Venkat Garimela. Thank you, uh, Pravinji. It's indeed a pleasure and a privilege to be part of such an esteemed uh, panelist. Uh, looking forward for a very engaging conversation, uh, Praveen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Rohit uh, Chasta, uh, Sustainability Business Leader, Snyder Electric India. He has been working at the intersection of sustainability technology, business and business, and leads sustainability initiatives for the company and help clients to help them achieve their sustainability and decarbonization aspirations. He is a CMVP and ISO lead auditor for energy management system, uh, 50001, and a lead green associate. Welcome, uh, Mr. Rohi Sasta, for this key conference. Thank you, Mr. Praveen. Pleasure to be in such eminent uh, gathering. Uh, thank you. Looking forward. The key discussion points uh, that we are planning to cover in this e-conference is uh, embracing uh, clean technologies, uh, energy efficiency, safe to renewable feedstocks, circular economy approach, collaborative innovation, policy and regulatory support, life cycle assessment, consumer demand and behavior change, and science-based target initiative, SBTI. So uh, we have this interesting uh, play and win context to make it more interesting to all our delegates. 
uh, just uh, about the contest and the terms and conditions. The moderator shall be asking questions from the delegate during the course of the session, and the one who responds fast with the correct answer stands eligible for winning rupees 1000 gift voucher from Amazon. All the questions will be asked by the moderator of the session and replies to be given in the chat window. I repeat, all the replies needs to be given in the chat window and box of your respective screen on Zoom platform. Final winners will be announced at the close of the e-conference session today at 4.30 p.m. Terms and conditions, only the person with the correct answer responding first in order of priority shall be declared winner. Organizers and sponsor partner employees are not eligible to participate in the context. Organizers' decision to be treated as final in case of any discrepancies. Gift watchers to be sent electronically to all the winners post completion of the sessions. Just a small slide on uh, Indian Chemical News uh, stats. You would be receiving our newsletter on a daily basis, which goes to around 49,000 people. Open rate of 30%, click rate of 8%, page views of 148,760, which is monthly, users of around 80,000, and LinkedIn followers. Uh, I think uh, we would be closing at uh, uh, 72,000. Uh, when, when I made this, it was 71,941. And the last, when I said, uh, looked at it, it was 71,982. So it would have crossed 80,000. So thank you uh, from my side. This is, was a short presentation without wasting any time. I would now request Mr. Gianluca Marola, Global Business Development for Specialty Chemicals, Snyder Electric to give his presentation. And after that, uh, uh, Mr. Rohit Chasta, Sustainability Business uh, Leader, uh, Snyder Electric India will give his presentation. Uh, Gyan Luka will focus on, 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 give an overview on sustainability, whereas Mr. Rohit Chasta will focus on roadmap on sustainability. So over to Mr. Gyan Luka Marola and then to Mr. Rohit Chasta. Thanks a lot and uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, everybody. Uh, I will be. Uh, I'm. I'm very happy to be part of this. Uh, uh, of this theme, and uh, I'm honored uh, to walk you through uh, the key subjects for us, which is going to be how we uh, go uh, towards net zero direction in the chemical sector. I'm uh, Gianluca Merola, and I'm uh, helping. Uh, Schneider and uh, our clients uh, in uh, uh, developing uh, solutions which uh, help them in increasing their uh, sustainability. Myself, I'm a chemical engineer like uh, many of the, the people in this audience. So I'm very pleased to work through a subject which is also uh, very important for me uh, personally. Uh, first, I wanted to uh, just give a quick snapshot about uh, uh, Schneider Electric, which is uh, a, a uh, technology leader, global technology leader in the electrification sector, as well automation digitization. We work overall uh, with a very vast uh, network of uh, uh, local uh, partners, and uh, we are uh, ourselves an EC uh, champion. Uh, Schneider Electric has been considered in, for several years as number one uh, uh, sustainable uh, company in the world. We are a very big organization with about 150,000 uh, employees distributed globally, and we work with a multi-hub uh, model uh, to uh, empower our local organization in each country to be more effective in dealing with uh, uh, our client. Um, last point that is worth considering is that we are spending uh, a big amount of our efforts in increasing our digital uh, footprint and offering for our clients. Um, as I said, uh, we are uh, uh, leveraging uh, a very vast uh, group of collaborators across the, the world, but we are very uh, distributed, uh, uh, well distributed on a, on a regional basis. The company originally is actually a French uh, organization, but as you see from this slide, revenues as well as people representation is very uh, much uh, spread across the globe. 
And since we are addressing today uh, 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 an Indian audience, uh, I think it was worth to underline the connections that uh, we have as an organization with India. We can define ourselves really an Indian organization thinking about it uh, because uh, 40,000 people out of our uh, 150 are actually based out of India. And uh, uh, this is no surprise as being been in India for uh, over 60 years, and uh, India represents for uh, Schneider Electric the third biggest uh, uh, market uh, on uh, overall. Um, we are also uh, recognized not just for our sustainability impact, but also uh, for our supply chain. Right? Uh, specifically for what concern uh, the uh, offering that we propose to the industry is uh, obviously a key starting point. Um, I wanted also to briefly introduce what we do, and I think many of you in this audience will be somehow familiar, but just to state a few key critical points. Schneider, uh, as an organization, is really uh, leveraging two uh, big uh, segments. On one end, we are active on the energy uh, man management uh, division, providing lead, uh, low and medium voltage uh, equipment, uh, so very traditional hardware. On the other end, and this is very pertinent uh, uh, also for uh, uh, the chemical sector we are addressing uh, today, we are very much focusing on the industrial automation uh, arena. And so uh, some of the products that uh, many people in this audience will have heard about uh, are the Foxboro, for instance, DCS, uh, the uh, PLCs or our uh, hybrid DCS modicum. We are addressing ourselves to four different uh, industry sectors, data centers, building, the industrial sector overall, which is uh, directly concerned by the discussion today, the infrastructure uh, arena. Our two big uh, division, the industrial automation one and the energy management uh, uh, division are pulled together then and supported overall uh, um, by the software services that we are offering uh, across the two uh, uh, offerings, so both on the energy management and the industrial automation. And uh, many of you might be already familiar with the Aviva uh, software uh, and, or Aviva uh, Pi uh, systems, which are very commonly uh, used in the industry. But our software engagement has been actually expanding uh, day by day, and we are growing actually in this sector more and more. So um, this said, uh, we are doing all this and we consider ourselves uh, very active on the sustainability sector uh, because uh, we are focusing on uh, some key basics uh, elements. We are willing to help our clients uh, to better use uh, the energy and the resources that they are um, leveraging to get to their uh, finished product. In this sense, our mission is really to help uh, our uh, uh, clients in being uh, in progressing our agenda in terms of sustainability and efficiency of their uh, operations. So this is to give a very simple uh, snapshot of the organization that we are. Now let me go a little bit more into the subject of the, the discussion today and start from, uh, 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 you know, one uh, very simple uh, reflection. Um, a lot of the, our day-to-day -day routine uh, is today uh, focusing on, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, wars, uh, energy shortages, maybe uh, the <laughs> uh, U.S. elections, uh, the Indian elections, not 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 long ago, uh, new variants uh, going on, uh, you know, on uh, the COVID side. But what's up? What 
is happening on a consistent basis in uh, the background is that we, we, we register a, a continuous series of uh, um, uh, challenges which are uh, uh, climate related. And uh, uh, this slide actually was done in 2022, so it reports some of the, the challenges were registered uh, uh, that year. But, but uh, you know, uh, probably uh, some of you heard that uh, uh, July 23rd was considered uh, uh, the hottest day registered uh, for our planet uh, ever. And uh, uh, same thing happened. Uh, for the day after July 22nd. So um, I think that uh, um, uh, the uh, change in uh, the global climate is, uh, is, is actually one element which is going to, is impacting today our lives and is gonna continue unfortunately uh, to do so uh, for, uh, for uh, the years to come. So we are really facing uh, what uh, I define here a uh, planetary uh, crisis. And uh, this is not unfortunately only uh, one because uh, uh, many of you will be familiar also with uh, the pollution challenges that we face and biodiversity losses that equally we are uh, uh, facing today. And uh, I think, uh, you know, being a chemical engineer, uh, I realize that, uh, uh, you know, as a chemical engineer, I'm having a role in the manufacture of many of the goods that are uh, surrounding uh, uh, us. And I realize that uh, this planetary crisis matters a lot to the industry I'm, uh, I'm coming from. Um, uh, the, the pollution perspective is, uh, is uh, particularly important uh, to me and is something that impacts uh, me a lot. And, and I thought to share, uh, you know, one slide about it uh, uh, today. But uh, um, I've been involved uh, in uh, the plastic manufacturing for uh, many, many years. And uh, uh, I find uh, uh, disconcerting some of the reports uh, suggesting that uh, uh, by 2050, for instance, in uh, the oceans, there will be more plastic than fish. And uh, another uh, data point that I heard recently is that everybody of us uh, is uh, eating on a weekly basis, the equivalent in weight of a, a, a credit card um, in plastic due to the fact that, uh, uh, you know, we are surrounded by microplastic uh, uh, particles. So these are uh, uh, somber uh, news, I think, that uh, requires us to take some uh, some action, and uh, still on uh, uh, the challenging side, uh, you know, even after uh, uh, COVID, uh, when things slow down in 2022, we registered again a new uh, record high. Uh, level of emissions uh, 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 for for our uh, CO2 emissions due to the uh, industrial processes. And chemical sector uh, after iron and steel is actually one big contributor to this uh, overall uh, uh, number. So, uh, I mean, all these elements make me feel uh, responsible and make me think about uh, you know, um, uh, how to uh, address the situation. Now, uh, one of the interesting elements uh, that, uh, you know, I started uh, uh, to look at uh, is the fact that, uh, for instance, a big part of the energy used in uh, the industry is not, uh, uh, is coming um, uh, from non, uh, from fossil fuels and non-electrified uh, is not electrified. And as such, this is actually uh, at the same time a challenge uh, because, I mean, there is such a big part of the energy not being electrified and then as such uh, origin uh, to those uh, CO2 emission, but it's also positive news because uh, uh, electrification is something that we can control uh, today. So, I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, this is a little bit our starting point. 
And uh, so it's obvious that we are asking uh, ourselves, how do we get out of this uh, uh, situation? And um, uh, there are no easy recipes uh, uh, for this, but uh, uh, there is a direction that I think overall uh, the industry is taking. And uh, uh, I'm happy uh, we can, uh, we can uh, definitely uh, support. On one hand, uh, you know, refocusing on natural uh, products um, that, uh, you know, are, 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 are uh, easier uh, to handle and somehow less polluting to the environment. And for instance, if within the specialty chemical sector, cosmetic sector has been engaging quite a bit in this direction already. So this is something that is, is happening today. The second element, that I consider with uh, uh, specific interest is the focus that we are putting on uh, reuse and recycle. So moving a little bit from a linear kind of economy towards a more uh, circular uh, one. This is very applicable to the plastic sector. It is still at the beginning driven by a lot of startups, but, but, but uh, still uh, a work in progress. But there are very encouraging uh, directions in uh, in this sense. And then the third element, which is addressing more the energy transition, uh, is, is actually the electrification of uh, 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 the, 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 the energy supply, which uh, obviously uh, on the short term is something that we can do right now. The technology is available right now and uh, uh, can impact a variety of uh, processes. Uh, uh, Schneider has actually a long-term and well-established experience in this sense. And uh, uh, we realize also that electrification on its own is, is a good thing, but uh, putting electrification together with digitalization of the operation is helping in improving the efficiency and ultimately making uh, the, the, the objective of becoming a more sustainable uh, organization, something which is uh, easier uh, to reach. Um, I wanted to close this brief introduction before passing uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the rest of the presentation to my colleague uh, uh, Rohit, uh, underlining that uh, in many industrial uh, processes, electrification is not something that might happen in the future, but it's something for which technologies, uh, awareness and uh, existing experiences are readily uh, available. And uh, in this slide, which is a uh, very high level, I uh, wanted, you know, to highlight some of the arenas where electrification is definitely something that can happen as, uh, as, uh, as we talk uh, today. This said, I'd like Roit to take over and share uh, uh, your slide to walk the audience uh, through the rest of the presentation. Sure, thank you Gianluca for the, for the setting up the context and putting the <clears throat> pieces into motion. Uh, I am, as we speak, sharing my screen and I hope that is visible to everyone. So basically when we talk about, you know, uh, again, Gianluca, you said the context uh, in, a, in a pretty right way. And uh, again, I don't want to spend too much uh, time on, on reiterate, reiterating the same thing, but it's the topic is, is, is such that we need uh, to like, you know, kind of bring this to everyone's notice uh, time and again that how the whole piece of climate uh, change is, is, uh, is a topic of super urgency. And the long and short of the story is that in order, and this is what the climate science told, tells us that in order to, to uh, make sure that we sustain our planet and the climate change impacts don't become irreversible, we have to limit the temperature rise of the planet to 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, as compared to the pre-industrial uh, era. And for that, we are talking about, uh, like, you know, uh, while the government and the economies and the businesses, they realize this challenge and they have taken many, uh, you know, ambitions in terms of commitments and decarbonization targets. But today, the question is that, is that uh, piece enough? Uh, and the answer to that is currently no, uh, because the way we have been proceeding on this whole piece of climate trajectory 
will end up uh, in the trajectory of uh, four to six degrees Celsius if there was an absence of all these targets. Even if we align with all these pledges and targets that we have taken, we will still end up in the 2.5 to 2.9 degrees Celsius scenario uh, by the end of this century as compared to the pre-industrial era. And we need to strive towards the 1.5 degrees Celsius scenario by the end of this century, uh, which is nothing but making three to five times higher abatement of emissions by 2030 in the next decade and making sure that our emissions are zero or near to zero by 2050. So that's the equation as simple as this uh, when we talk about this whole piece of climate urgency. Uh, and you know this is something which even Jen Luca uh, mentioned in his presentation, so I won't go into the detail, but it's if we, if we see the source of all the emissions, it's all about energy and related processes. So that's the area that we need to focus on. That's the area which we need to uh, target. And if we see where these energy and related emissions uh, are coming from, uh, globally, we see, again, if we talk about the end use sector, we see industries, buildings, transport, all of these, of course, you know, contributing to the whole, whole piece of, of emissions which are there. Uh, if we talk about in India, uh, most of the emissions are coming from the industries. And if I talk about, uh, let's say, the chemical segment there, uh, almost 10% of those industrial emissions come from the chemical sector or the chemical industry. So this is one place uh, where we need to like, you know, definitely focus upon. And chemical manufacturing processes uh, does pose you know, some substantial challenges also. Uh, when it comes to the whole aspect of emissions or uh, sustainability related aspects because we if we see the whole profile of how the chemical industry is placed we are talking about uh, you know something on the lines of uh, whether it is you know the process linked emissions which are basically your co2 or ghg emissions coming from uh, chemical manufacturing processes through electricity consumed or production of feedstock or manufacturing process and on the other hand, we also have the end of life and feedstock emissions, which comes because of the fact that uh, the disposal of the chemicals at the end of its life, uh, this could be through uh, disposal by combustion, it can be through landfills, water bodies. Uh, so typically the carbon locked into the process is also released during these uh, particular times. So this is what a typical chemical uh, industry emission profile uh, would, would look like and this is where you know we are talking about uh, not just uh, from a point of view of fuel or processes and end product but we are talking about overall uh, the the emission piece coming from energy feedstock uh, the direct emissions the indirect emissions what we call as scope 1 and scope 2 emissions and of course uh, towards the scope 3 part of it which is about either the the upstream supply chain or the the end use uh, in terms of the end of life uh, piece of these emissions. And this is where it would be very interesting to see uh, how the, the direct and indirect and the, the, the value chain emissions uh, look when it comes to a chemical industry or a chemical sector. So if you see, this is uh, again coming from some, you know, uh, an external research uh, that uh, was there in, in, the, in, the, in the public domain. And if you see the chemical industry emissions profile, we're talking about uh, the whole piece of approximately 65 to 7. And this is all India based, by the way. This is all the piece which is there for India. So we're talking about around 70 million tons of scope 1 and scope 2 emissions, uh, which are basically energy and process link mainly, uh, which are coming from uh, the various, you know, if I talk about the combined figure of a chemical uh, industry or a chemical sector, and approximately same, like you know, 50% uh, similar to that, around 65 to 70 million tons of emissions is coming from scope three, uh, which is all about the feedstock-based emissions or the end-of-life uh, treatment of the products. Uh, and if you if we see the whole, you know, the value chain of a chemical industry, we're talking about around 50% of the emissions coming from scope one and scope two, while the remaining 50% uh, are coming from the scope three. Uh, or the extended value chain of of a company and this is uh, where uh, while of course um, you know it varies the scope 3 emissions is what we always say that this is where the devil lies so the scope 3 emissions varies from various 
like you know uh, industry to industry in some industries it is more than 90 percent uh, uh, of the emission are contributed by scope 3 because we have very like you know emission intensive processes uh, in the chemical segment itself that's the reason we're here talking about you know almost a 50 percent uh, uh, ratio of scope 1 2 and scope 3 emissions so so this is what your typical profile of uh, of a chemical industry looks like when it comes to uh, the various you know source of emissions if if we consider now let's see towards the second piece of it in terms of what we can do to decarbonize these emissions or to move towards the the pathway of reducing these emissions in the coming decades in the coming years now traditionally uh, if you see this whole aspect of scope 1 scope 2 and scope 3 emissions and as we established from the beginning that most of these emissions are coming from energy and related processes so if we see the whole landscape of energy, one thing that we see, and this is again coming from our own internal uh, researches as well as external uh, uh, simulation-based market research, that if we talk about the whole aspect of decarbonizing the, the energy uh, sector, uh, it's very important that we handle or we tackle the energy demand side. Uh, traditionally, the whole decarbonization of energy landscape has always been associated with uh, switching to uh, you know uh, supply side decarbonization measures like switching to renewables and all those aspects which is very important but is not the complete story if we talk about where the other half of uh, opportunities on decarbonization is coming from that's where we see this whole aspect of energy demand so it's very important that we tackle energy demand because almost 55 percent of the decarbonization opportunities across sectors is coming from the demand side piece of it. And when we say demand side piece, we're talking about two things here. One is about reducing the energy and resource demand. So not just energy efficiency, but as uh, even you know, uh, in the previous session, in the previous presentation, we saw that how circularity is of, is of utmost importance as well. So both uh, energy efficiency as well as uh, resource efficiency through circularity is something that is very much uh, needed and then that's very much the first step uh, that we need to take in order to decarbonize uh, the the initial piece of, of of emissions which are coming from scope one and scope two uh, or the direct emissions which are coming from uh, direct and indirect which are coming from the the chemical industry the second piece which is very important is switching to a more decarbonized source of power and it's not just from a point of view of uh, you know what we call as fuel switch but the ultimate piece is also on the lines of that how we can move towards electrifying our processes uh, why electrification because electrification is the most uh, you can say efficient and fastest way to decarbonize the process uh, again just to give you some examples here specifically towards the chemical industry if you see last year, we had published this report called Amrit Kal Path to Developed and Decarbonized India. Now, this is a, a report that we did like, you know, in collaboration with some industry experts and as well as our own internal sustainability research institute. Uh, and you can always, you know, you can download this, you can scan this QR, it's on public domain, it's available. Uh, what we saw or what we tried to kind of collate in this report was that how or what it will take for India to achieve its decarbonization ambition and also achieve the, the targets that it has set uh, for net zero and for decarbonization in the coming decades. And as part of the, uh, that process, we even did uh, a, a plus one level uh, analysis of various sectors on the same line. So when we did it for the chemical industry, and if I see, let's say the path or the roadmap for a chemical industry to become uh, let's say decarbonized or zero to or, or uh, you know zero or near to zero in terms of its emission uh, in the next three decades. Uh, let's say by 2050, aligning with the 1.5 degree Celsius scenario. Today we see that the share of electrification is around 16 percent. Uh, if we talk about you know the today's uh, situation uh, in this whole piece of of the the energy demand that a chemical industry has. What we found out in our research is that when we simulated various pathways of how a chemical industry can decarbonize, we saw that in the next 30 years uh, or 25 to 30 years, if uh, we need to be on the pathway of, of decarbonizing this industry, 
we need to increase the share of electrification to almost 80% uh, by 2050 uh, in this particular area. And that is when we would be on the correct path. And that is when we would uh, you know, make sure that the emissions are reduced uh, to a minimal extent when it comes to this particular sector. And this is something that we, we found out and we, we thought that it's important that we share it with the larger audience uh, on the same lines as well. So this is this is what the whole aspect of demand side decarbonization works with. Uh, as I said, almost 55% of the total decarbonization opportunity is going to come from energy efficiency, circularity, and process electrification. But when we talk about process electrification, again, it's just a me, it's not the end, it's just a means to an end. Because after we have electrified the processes, that's when the importance of supply side decarbonization comes into picture very much. And we should make sure that the electricity, uh, the processes that we have electrified, we should make sure that more and more of that electricity is coming from renewable sources of energy. That's the pathway which we, with whom or with what we are going to achieve this whole piece of decarbonization uh, in this sense. And that's where we're talking about, you know, uh, this whole piece of energy demand side decarbonization and energy supply side decarbonization. So almost half of what is coming from demand side decarbonization and when done in collaboration or in integration with the supply side piece, that's where we are going to proceed forward uh, for uh, an end-to-end -end decarbonization for the sector, for the industry. Uh, and also, again, it's very much, uh, again, it's a stated fact that, you know, chemical industry, it's also a sector which is not very easy to abate in terms of emissions. It's a hard to abate sector as well. And that is where we see that while there will be certain opportunities that will come in future, in near term, in mid term, in long term, like your green hydrogen or uh, even the whole aspect of CCUS, carbon capture, utilization and storage, and even bio-based feedback, uh, bio-based feedstocks, which will be coming uh, in, in the coming time. So all that is definitely going to impact uh, this particular piece. But today, if we talk about this today, almost 70% of the emission can still be removed using the existing technologies that we have uh, in the present scenario, in the present world. And that's what we have seen across various segments. Now, just to give you an idea of what we do, uh, this is exactly the approach that we take. And this is how we work with organizations with an end-to-end -end integrated approach, uh, starting with the whole piece of strategizing through our sustainability consulting business, where we make sure that the complete scope one, scope two, scope three emissions are completely inventorized. They are baselined because it's as simple as this that we cannot improve uh, if we don't have a baseline set on that, and then only we can make targets and roadmap on the same. So the first thing is to create a complete strategy, baselining, create a decarbonization roadmap for the same, and align the same with external frameworks and agencies. It can be reporting frameworks and protocols like your GRIs and CDPs and CCFDs, or even it can be uh, alignment with net zero agencies like science-based target initiative, SBTI. So that's the first step that we do when we, you know, uh, we, we collaborate with, with organizations on their sustainability and decarbonization journey. The second step is the whole aspect of digitization. So once we have the strategy in place, the next step is to digitize the whole piece uh, and make sure that we are on a regular basis tracking uh, the whole aspect of our progress. Uh, we are seeing how we are performing. We are seeing how, what are the opportunities in terms of improvement. So just to give you a snapshot, this is what a typical you know, uh, piece of digitizing the whole thing can look like. So if you see monitoring all my scope one, scope two, scope three emissions uh, in, in, our, in the company, seeing which are the hotspots uh, on a month to month basis, it can be quarter to quarter or it can be year to year as well, so that we can take uh, actions based upon the fact which is data driven, where we can see where are the hotspots and accordingly we can take actions as well and even you know kind of benchmarking uh, our own organization's portfolio against the various sites uh, that we have so which site is performing how in terms of the emissions all these things can be tracked uh, from a single platform and that's how we we approach this whole situation when we are working with various organizations and not just from a point of view of emissions but even from a point of view of energy and processes so 
what is the let's say you know the utility consumption or the utility performance when it comes to boilers compressors chillers what's the steam to fuel ratio how is the uh the, the 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 performance of the chiller or the compressor or any other utilities that they might have uh setting targets benchmarks performance uh trend lines and if there's any deviation uh, of course the idea is that through software through digital capabilities it can come back to us uh from a point of view of action items and lastly uh we are talking about this whole piece of decarbonization so once we have taken uh strategized the complete baseline roadmap digitize the whole thing the last point is to make sure that we take concrete actions in terms of efficiency improvement electrifying operations or even going to fuel switch for uh, low carbon based fuels and replacing the energy source with a green source of energy and lastly the whole idea is to make sure that the same thing we can replicate for our extended value chain as well so that we take care of the scope 3 emissions piece as well also so this is something that we do uh, with our uh, with various companies with various organizations and based on these uh, approaches this is just a quick case uh, in terms of what we were we have been doing with one chemical uh, multinational company in india uh, where we specifically you know we worked with them uh, on the lines of optimizing scope 1 co2 emissions and along with that also meet their regulatory requirement Uh, so we did a complete in-depth decarbonization assessment of their equipment their fuel consumption their complete potential of co2 reduction and the tco the total cost of ownership uh, through all of that how they can achieve the sustainability goals the idea was to give them various options uh, what it can be for a heating system in terms of going for a low carbon uh, option like it can be briquettes it can be an electric system with uh, integrated with uh, uh, an offsite power purchase agreement and also virtual power purchase agreement uh, or going with electric uh, based uh, heating along with just an offsite ppa and also another option of of natural gas which is there so we kind of did this complete assessment for them for all options and showed them the pros and cons of each of the same as well lastly the way we kind of in, you know uh, proceeded on that was a, a hybrid approach where through uh, certain hybrid measures some electric some renewables and some low carbon fuels we were able to reduce their complete you know uh, sort of total cost of ownership for the plant by 13% with a 45% co2 reduction uh, in scope one every year so that is something uh, as a quick uh, sort of you know piece that we wanted to showcase what we have done and some more projects are on the lines of uh, you know doing complete renewable energy power purchase agreement for a swiss chemical multinational in india which is helping them reduce 4000 tons of scope 2 emissions every year along with 2.4 crores of annual energy cost savings as well which goes for a long term 15 year contract uh, also we have been working with some global chemical companies a global chemical distributor imcd where we are doing a complete baselining emissions assessment and a modeling target setting and decarbonization road map for them Uh, as well as the south american chemical company unipar where the whole idea is to enhance their climate strategy through cdp reporting and sbti roadmap uh, alignment as well so these are some quick quick snapshot of what we have been doing i would you know uh, put my piece here uh, in terms of uh, i'll end my presentation here and put my uh, voice on hold uh, and because we'll have a exciting panel discussion coming after this uh, but after this we are open to question and answers as well so feel free to please put your points on chat and we can always see the same so thank you all thank you for your attention and looking forward to the panel discussion now thank you over to you mr so thank you mr gyanluka marula and mr rohit chasta for your presentation uh we before we start the panel discussion uh, let me have the two announcements first is a uh, 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 i would request all delegates to get ready for icm play and in context and uh, so one thing we have to remember is please uh, 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 what we can say please uh, send your uh, replies to uh, to be given in the chat window all replies to be given in the chat window that's the only thing uh, which i thought of uh, reminding you so the first question uh, on your screen so the first is which are the key decarbonization levers and technologies commercially available today that have potential to reduce maximum emissions a energy efficiency electrification use of renewables b green hydrogen 
and C, carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Let me ask the team to put the second question. Typically, how much share of emissions are contributed by scope 3, upstream plus downstream, in the chemical sector value chain? A, less than 10%, B, around 50%, C, more than 95%. Please uh, put the third slide. Process electrification and efficiency improvements can be done. A, already now on many processes and heat transfer operations. B, cannot be done. We are locked with fossil fuels. C, electrification technology is not mature yet in most cases. So thank you for your answers. Uh, I request uh, all delegates to fill uh, the Microsoft form, which is there on the chat window. I request my team to put uh, the Microsoft form on the chat window. Just click on it. And uh, this Microsoft form tries to capture sustainability journey of your company. I hope uh, they have put the form on the screen. So please uh, click on that and fill up the form so that we can come to know about your sustainability journey, which will be helpful uh, for us. So now we come to the most uh, important part of uh, this e-conference, which is the panel discussion. And we have with us uh, eminent speakers, Mr. Girish Shatarkar, Executive Director, Deepak Nitri Limited, Mr. K.K. Sharma, Old Time Director, EHS, DCM Sriram Limited, Dr. Mirtunjay Chaube, Global Vice President, Environment and Sustainability, UPL Limited, uh, Mr. Venkat Garimela, Vice President, Strategy and Sustainability, Snyder Electric India, and I would be the moderator for the session. So my first question to all the panelists, uh, to start with uh, Mr. Ginesh Parker, uh, Mr. K.K. Sharma, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mirtunjay Chaube, and to Venkat Garimela, would be the key trends that you foresee in the chemical industry that will affect the company's journey toward decarbonization and, and in achieving net zero. So I would request all of you to give short answers, 60 seconds of introductory remarks. To start with, uh, Mr. Girish Sataifar, over to you, sir. So good afternoon, everybody. And of course, thank you again, uh, Pravinji. I must commend the efforts taken by Indian Chemical uh, News to bring the awareness about this particular uh, subject, which, in my opinion, has not really sipped through uh, many of the organization even yet. So uh, this is something which is really good. Second, of course, the quiz which you have uh, announced, which really draws the participation into it. And I'm sure that will help the increasing the awareness greatly. Now, coming to the trends, because, of course, there is a time limit, and I am quite acutely aware of that, that we need to wrap up this discussion also well in time. The, the, I must also thank to the presenters, uh, uh, both the presenters from the Schneider. And what comes out very clearly is the sense of timing uh, with respect to the net zero mission, because uh, the numbers generally we talk in millions and billions, but in the in the presentation we saw gigatons so sparingly used, which really uh, should make all of us sit tight and uh, take note of the uh, uh, the race against time, uh, which we have to ensure. So I believe the, uh, the major trends which are going to uh, impact the net zero uh, mission, of course, is A, as I shared, uh, the sense of timing, uh, which needs to be understood well. The second is, of course, the regulatory requirements which are going to come uh, hard on to industry. For example, uh, CBAM, which is already now in force for certain industries like uh, steel, cement, and aluminum. And I'm sure that is going to uh, percolate down to the chemicals very soon. So the concept of carbon tax is already in place. Of course, I think on the nuance, uh, carbon tax and therefore carbon offsetting is not exactly net zero, which we can talk about in uh, following uh, discussion. The second um, important trend would be competitive considerations because no uh, organization would like to be left behind if the sustainability is not addressed uh, here and now. 
and third of course is uh, as i said this also will create help uh, help in creating the competitive advantage for the corporations so it should be uh, taken uh, in that sense as well the other trend which can really impact is the guidelines and agreements which take place at the international level for example uh, kyoto to paris agreement to of course cop26 and uh, so the, the the pressure is building from top down and of course uh, most critical the sustenance of uh, uh, and enhancing the investors and stakeholders uh, confidence so i believe these are some of the major trends which are going to impact the journey of uh, net zero mission for any corporation thank you uh, thank you girish ji uh, now i would request uh, mr kk sharma uh, from dcm sri ram to give his introductory remarks of 60 seconds over to mr kk sharma thank you very much uh, mr parveen and uh, fellow panelists uh, good afternoon to everyone i think it's a great uh, privilege to be part of this uh, panel discussion to start with i think a great uh, opportunity not only for learning but i think a good endeavor by icn in terms of raising this awareness along, along with the schneider is something which is a need of the hour where we can learn from each other what are the best thing happening across so that we can really copy with pride so that uh, it's something which is for the global cause that's one thing and i think this interactive session where the entire uh, uh, participants are engaged it's something very very uh, commendable uh, that i would like to appreciate uh, the effort taken by the team now talking about this uh, trend in chemical industry though uh, mr satarkar has already touched upon i will not repeat the points which he, have, he has already uh, pointed out to add to that is something like regulatory pressure is not only only limited to cbam but it is something brsr which is now mandatory for top 1000 companies where the uh, governance is something which is driving uh, for adopting net zero in terms of whatever actions the organizations are taking and in all those uh, brsr reporting the specific goals are required to be ultimately reported in terms of the progress also and uh, in the times to come as reasonable assurance is also something which is uh, now part of this uh, reporting as part of the core reporting for the top 150 uh, companies that is something which uh, even chemical industries is something uh, which is inevitable for them to avoid now having said that i think uh, the second part is in terms of the biomass or the low uh, emission carbon technologies that is the biomass or renewable is something which is uh, a uh, very much apt already shared in the previous uh, presentations uh, is something which is not only creating uh, opportunity for uh, chemical industry to adopt these technologies at the earliest but at the same time there are challenges in terms of its uh, availability accessibility and affordability that is something which we have to look as part of the chemical industry then comes i think we have talked about energy efficiency is something through digitalization how we are going to utilize this ai iot all these technologies in terms of improving energy efficiency at the same time reducing uh, emissions last but not the least already talked about in the in the previous presentation i think chemical industry is no way uh, now um, uh, they cannot ignore green chemistry it is something which is need of the hour where green products are to be encouraged so that uh, the overall emissions can be really uh, reduced and uh, net zero goal is achievable and electrification is already i think it's a reality now we have already seen in the previous presentation is something we have to look in chemical industry where it has to be look in terms of not only improvising the processes but also green hydrogen is something which is uh, also being looked at i think in the subsequent uh, discussion i'll be sharing my experience in terms of green hydrogen which we are already producing at uh, one of our facility in chloral green plant thank you very much uh, thank you sir uh, uh, we have an expert sitting here uh, who is focusing on sustainability and he has done it across the world with uh, multi different uh, uh, mncs so sir your uh, introductory views for 60 seconds dr mrtunjay chobe yes thank you uh, i think uh, already past two panelist has uh, uh, described uh, what kind of trend coming in chemical industry and i think uh, maybe it will be a repetition from my side also that uh, if we look the trend in chemical industry then there is a 
uh, more toward going sustainable and uh, embedding uh, sustainability, embedding ESG practices inside organization. This is now a trending uh, inside this industry. And why it's uh, happening? Because uh, one, uh, two panelists has described uh, regulatory uh, pressure and compliances are there. But I feel more from the investor. Uh, our company, UPL, is a listed company. And uh, my 30-40% time goes to interact with the investor. And nowadays, investors are pressurizing industry to adopt more and more sustainable practices, procedure, and, and they are asking that what is your decarbonization plan? Uh, what is your commitment time to have the carbon neutral or net zero? They are asking science-based target. They are asking about sustainability target goals, what you have achieved, where you are. Even they are asking TCFD report that where is the TCFD report of your company? So I think uh, there is a, a lot of demand from the investors and now the company are uh, looking toward ESG and sustainability. A part of investor, even uh, the talent, if you see, we, we are recruiting uh, talent from the industry. So nowadays, whatever the professionals coming in industry from the engineering or management colleges, they are also liking that uh, if this is the sustainable company, then we love to work. And they also refer sustainability report. Several times uh, it surprises me that when I take interview of uh, a new candidate, so they came with a thorough study of our UPL sustainability report. And, and when I ask that, do you have any question? So they ask some question from our sustainability report. So I think uh, uh, talent attraction is also nowadays a tool. Uh, sustainability is a, act as a tool. So these all are the trend. A part of this, I think uh, one important point for the chemical industry is go sustainable feedstock and sustainable procurement. That is also nowadays a trend catching because uh, when you want to export your chemical outside India, then more and more country nowadays asking disclosure of carbon. So they, they ask that uh, send your LCA, life cycle assessment, and uh, uh, see how much carbon is associated uh, throughout the life of this product. So I think unless until uh, you will have a sustainable feeder stock and sustainable procurement policy, it is very important to have lesser carbon footprint from your product. And today, this is a challenge for Indian industry that how they can compete in the world market because uh -huh. now Europe has already started asking that what is your carbon footprint from your products. And, and going forward, many more pressure will come and we have to compete and we have to prove that uh, we are not only cost uh, economical, but also in terms of carbon footprint, we are lesser among all the rest of the world. So I think that is trained nowadays where companies are taking action, not only uh, uh, how to uh, decarbonize, but also they have to look that uh, uh, before achieving the decarbonization goal, day by day, they have to prove that yes, they are uh, carbon footprint is decreasing and, and that is already pressure mounting on the Indian industry. And uh, uh, the good part is that many more organizations nowadays, they are coming, they are coming with public disclosure. They are coming out with commitment for the carbon neutrality. Uh, like at UPL, we have uh, done public commitment that uh, by 2040, we will achieve the carbon neutrality. Also, we have set our science-based target uh, approved with SBTI. So I think many more organizations are following this path and that is a good part and, and good thing happening in the ESG. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chaube. Uh, I come to the solution provider. 
and uh, we would be eager to know their views on uh, uh, what are the trends uh, that they foresee working with uh, chemical and petrochemical companies. So, Mr. Venkat uh, Garimela, Vice President, Strategy and Sustainability, Snyder Electric India. Yeah, thank you, Praveen, and a very, very insightful comments from all my esteemed panelists. You know, having been in the space of strategy, I think time has come now for most of the organizations to really undergo a strategic transformation to enable sustainability as the key topic uh, in the organization, cutting across all the departments, all the processes, and all the silos. I think this is a trend which is kind of catching up. I have seen some of the large uh, oil companies, how they are pivoting into a more sustainable organization which would mean taking really hard calls of maybe uh, exiting some business or developing some new kind of businesses, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that is one trend. And I like uh, what Mr. Chobeji just now said. You know what? If you're not sustainable, investors will not invest you. Prospective employees may not want to work with you. Customers may not even want to buy and transact with you, right? So I think this is really compelling the organization to have a very strategic and transformative way, uh, view on the topic of sustainability. The second point I think we will discuss more going forward uh, is all about how technology can be the enabler to bring this transformation for organizations on making them more sustainable. So being a technology supplier, I think I will add a few more points, maybe in the subsequent discussions. But I think these are the two trends uh, that, uh, Praveen, I observe. Back to you, Praveen. Uh, with the introductory remarks, now let me come to the challenges part of it. Uh, so here, the question to Mr. K.K. Sharma and Girish ji, uh, two of the, what we can say, large uh, chemical companies. What are the challenges I encountered in decarbonizing companies' uh, emission? And how have you addressed them through process and technology? To we'll start with uh, Mr. K.K. Sharma ji, and then Mr. Girish Akarkar. Thank you very much, uh, Praveen ji. Uh, in terms of uh, challenges that uh, we face is, uh, as I mentioned, in terms of biomass, it is the accessibility, availability, as well as affordability. That is ultimately one reason for uh, biomass utilization in our uh, uh, respective boilers, wherever we are operating, is something posing a challenge. But yes, in terms of uh, increasing this uh, biomass over uh, last uh, six to seven years, I've seen we started off our journey almost uh, uh, six years back when we were at 36% green direct energy at the company level. And now today we are at 43%. All these endeavors have uh, really helped in terms of increasing not only uh, non-fossil fuel based uh, fuels, but at the same time, putting uh, renewable uh, uh, power also at uh, uh, Gujarat, which has really helped us in improving our uh, green portfolio, where 50 megawatt was installed almost a year back. And today um, it is uh, uh, right now the challenge which we are facing is in terms of integrating this renewable power in our existing uh, captive power plant, I think operational challenges are there in terms of the synchronization during uh, this uh, usage of renewable. That's one. Then uh, next one is uh, in terms of energy efficiency, there are various initiatives that are undertaken in terms of putting uh, back pressure turbine. That's part of the energy efficiency. And uh, uh, then there is the uh, utilization of AI and IoT for uh, energy efficiency is something which is part of uh, improving our energy efficiency uh, and the usage of this digital twins is something which is uh, being used in terms of having uh, analysis of the heat rate so that we get the maximum uh, boiler efficiency. That's something which is uh, also uh, being used. And as I mentioned, uh, green hydrogen is something where this renewable power, whatever we are right now, is also because in our chloralkyl plant, hydrogen is a byproduct while producing uh, uh, caustic flakes as well as light through electrolysis process. So this hydrogen, what we produce is uh, utilized uh, in our furnaces where uh, fossil fuel is substituted uh, using this hydrogen. So thereby a lot of uh, emissions are getting uh, uh, reduced. Having said that, uh, there are also efforts in terms of uh, usage of pipeline for uh, transferring our products, which are in the name of, say, caustic lye or even hydrogen, even chlorine. 
so that we are eliminating uh, the road the transportation. That's something which is adding to lower emissions. Similarly, our raw materials which are received as well as finished wood in terms of the cement and fertilizer, that also is something where we are utilizing rakes, whereby the railway transportation is also one of the criteria in terms of reducing overall emission. Digitalization, as already mentioned in the previous presentations also, is something which is being used in terms of issuance of uh, purchase order as well as all, all digital banking transactions so that it's a paperless uh, transaction, thereby you are reducing emissions. And uh, uh, preventive schedules is something very, very important to understand, is something which is be based on various AI and uh, uh, ML-based analysis so that it's a, one of the, uh, you can say, criteria for resource optimization as well as uh, reducing the consumption of various uh, uh, maintenance uh, uh, parts. LCA is also one exercise which uh, Dr. Chaube also talked about in terms of carbon footprint. So we have carried out uh, LCA of all our products so that we know what are the hotspots so that we can work upon with collaborative efforts uh, of uh, with our value chain partners so that where we can improve upon in terms of, as we just heard, 50% of the emissions are contributing uh, from the uh, scope three. So that's another thing. But the challenge here is making uh, your value chain partner understanding the value of this ESG is something which is uh, posing a real challenge, which we have seen over the uh, couple of years. And... Uh, AI and ML data is also utilized for logistic purpose where all the vehicles which are outbound as well as inbound, we are tracking based on uh, the uh, AI as well as ML data so that vehicle tracking is put in place. And uh, uh, in terms of, yes, circularity is something which is also one of the uh, decarbonization uh, effort where we ensure that uh, the maximum uh, amount of waste or byproducts that are getting generated is gainfully utilized either in-house or outside. That's something which is on continual basis. Improvements are carried out uh, in terms of identifying such opportunities is on continual basis. I think in the subsequent uh, discussion, I'll be sharing more examples in terms of the research and R&D where these potentials are uh, clearly identified with collaborative approach uh, with various institutions so that the roadmap for uh, reducing our emissions is very, very clear and striving towards uh, our national uh, goal of achieving 50% uh, of the installed capacity by 2030. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would request Girishji, if you can talk about the challenges encountered in decarbonizing. Yes, sir. Thank you, Pravinji, again. And of course, thank you, uh, Sharmaji, for giving the insights about the challenges you are facing, which can, of course, be a learning experience for uh, other companies like ours. Uh, as I said uh, in the beginning, the net zero uh, mission is an overwhelming uh, uh, subject and therefore the challenges will depend on the state of maturity that company or corporation has. If I talk at the uh, at a very high level, the, the, the challenges which any company uh, would get, face when they get in, get embark on the uh, uh, net zero uh, mission, the first and foremost would, of course, be the balance between profitability and sustainability. Now, this is something a very uh, uh, relevant topic in, uh, especially when the business environment stand very, very hostile and we are not able to, uh, or the companies are not able to at times uh, meet up their expectation with respect to the top line, bottom line. In those scenarios, prioritizing the uh, uh, resource availability or capital allocation for sustainability can become a huge, huge challenge. And that is where something uh, which, which needs to be uh, deliberated very, very seriously by uh, the stakeholders. The second, of course, again, at a high level is uh, the developing the mindset. Because as I can say, uh, as I say, this is seen as a cost to begin with, which of course is not the cost, but actually a, a remedy for sustainability. But unless and until the, the organizations, and I'm talking about all uh, for all small and mid-sized organizations. So unless and until that will and a foresight or the mindset is developed, it will be extremely difficult for uh, those organizations to see the um, end, 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 uh, end result of this journey and the compulsions which they will have to go through. The third is, of course, within any organization is, of course, interfunctional uh, 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 priorities. 
the business may want uh, something to be done on urgent basis because that is what probably is the need of the uh, business from the market standpoint but uh, on the other side the legal or the uh, the finance would have a, a completely a divergent uh, 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 view on that and therefore the alignment within the organization to come to a common ground and take the sustainability journey forward can be uh, uh, something which which could be daunting third uh, fourth of course is the technological support there are technologies available as we have seen in the past presentations also from schneider and of course the earlier speakers did mention about various technologies which are being deployed but uh, probably we in in our opinion uh, there are still a lot of uh, uh, distance is to be traveled and the that is something which always be counted with respect to the benefit which those technology will uh, bring in and the last point which i want to emphasize is again at the uh, high level in terms of the the national and state level policies uh, we have seen and encountered those who have gone ahead with the renewable energy the difference between the uh, the the policy matters between two states for example maharashtra and gujarat uh, there is there is no i mean there is there is alignment now but of course it has come over a period of time and that really complicates uh, the matter for the companies like ours who have multi locational plant in uh, uh, various states but having said this i must also highlight and commend the the initiatives which uh, our, our our government is taking basically to promote the renewable energy and therefore sustainability efforts and i think only two days ago a budget was announced a uh, lot of things have been announced in that budget which will of course go well for the sustainability journey in india for example in case of renewable they have doubled the outlay from say 9000 crore to 19000 crore which is a welcome sign they have of course uh, talked about bioenergy rooftop solar where they are promising about 300 units free free for first 1 uh, uh, crore um, uh, install uh, uh, users then of course they are announcing the plis for the solar cells solar vapors which uh, again a, a very very sensitive issue for us because on one side we are targeting 500 gig gigawatts by 2030 and on the other side 90% of our solar solar uh, panels or solar solar vapors gets imported from outside and therefore it is important that we bring that balance and i'm sure i'm happy that the government has done an address that particular particular uh, concern similarly on this uh, pumped storage which was again a major uh, step forward i believe in terms of achieving the uh, hydro electricity uh, sustainability so uh, to cut uh, the long story short there are challenges but i believe there is a wide awareness prevalent into the government uh, the the agencies and of course it is sipping in the corporations so uh, over a period of time as i said in the beginning as the maturity grows of an organization as a corporation i believe the journey will become more and more meaningful and more and more productive for that particular organization thank you uh, uh, thank you giri ji uh, now i come to the third part uh, and here uh, the focus is on long term vision for achieving uh, net zero emissions how does the company align uh, its vision with the current demands by balancing sustainability and profitability to we'll start with uh, dr chobe and then uh, would uh, request uh, girish ji to join yes so uh, we have set our target for the uh, carbon neutrality and uh, our long term target is 2040 so we have publicly committed at upl that by 2040 globally we will achieve the carbon neutrality and for that we have a detailed decarbonization road map and uh, we set uh, three uh, targets for our global operations one is a short term target for the decarbonization then the mid term and the long term so in short term target uh, we set target our baseline we created in 2019 20 and we set first five year target that is a short term that by 2025 we will reduce 25% our emission uh, and uh, today if you see a uh, still one year is there for 2025 and we have achieved 33% reduction in in 
carbon emission. So that is a short-term target. Uh, Mid-term target, we have set science-based target. And uh, our science-based target is validated and approved by uh, UN-initiated organization, SBTI. There, uh, our target is to reduce 64% uh, emission by 2035 and uh, long term is by 2040 carbon neutrality. So I think that is about the uh, target which we set for the carbon neutrality. Now uh, to achieve this, uh, we are focusing on many more things. Initially, we focus much more toward our operational excellence uh, through operational excellence, we be able to achieve a lot of carbon emissions and uh, we get very good result. Uh, also, uh, we are uh, focusing on renewable source of energy. So to uh, start this, one good part we started that uh, if we have any boiler or power plant uh, based upon coal, historically, then it is, it is very, very difficult to change immediately, but we bring a policy inside organization that let's uh, have uh, biomass at least 15%. You replace uh, coal 15% with the biomass and uh, that policy we brought and that is now helpful to reduce the carbon emission. Also, we have done green power purchase agreement. So recently, uh, we have done for the approximately 70 megawatt grain power purchase agreement and that is also now we are uh, starting getting credit for that. So that also helped us a lot to reduce our carbon emission. Going forward, we are focusing on many new energy like uh, we feel that going forward, maybe hydrogen energy will be the another way forward where we able to replace a lot of our energy through the hydrogen energy, a lot of work going on. And uh, also carbon capture and uh, storage. So there we are doing a lot of work and we are hopeful that through carbon uh, storage and capture, uh, we will able to meet our uh, carbon neutrality target. So I think these things happens about uh, this carbon reduction. Uh, at this moment, I mean, last three, four years, if you see, then we mo more focus on the tracking mechanism. Because uh, earlier what happens, we used to track the carbon emission and uh, our plants are globally situated and uh, approximately 50 plants are there and uh, uh, only 15% are in India, rest are outside India. And suppose if you calculated all the carbon emission at end of year, then we found no use because uh, then by that time operation able to understand that uh, they have not met the target, then, then what they can do? Only they can now next year focus. But right now what we have done, we have designed our in-house designed sustainability tracker. And uh, that sustainability tracker on daily basis track the carbon emission. And we have created the mechanism that uh, at the beginning we set the target for all our operation. And suppose the carbon emission is increasing, then the alarm get created by that uh, tracker itself. And that tracker send the alarm to the plant as well as to the uh, sustainability team and then we discuss uh, with them and uh, immediate the measures we start taking. And this we are not doing only for carbon. We are capturing water also. We are capturing uh, waste uh, information also. So I think uh, I feel that uh, target is very important and we should must have a target approach from top to down approach. If you start discussing with operation that what should be target, what is achievable, I don't think uh, you will end with the right target. But I, I feel that, and my experience with industry is this, uh, earlier I was with Unilever, now with UPL, the target should must be set from top to down approach. 
but well communicate to the operation that uh, this is your target you must have to achieve. Second thing I told you that the have in place the tracking mechanism and it should be on a either daily or monthly basis. If you collect data on yearly basis, then I don't think there is much more use. Only it will helpful for the reporting, but not much more of use. And, and the third part is that uh, the sustainability team should support technically operation. Because I found that when you only track the data, only set the target, then operation see you as a policing approach. But if you have a technical team and you support the operation technically that how to bring down the emission, that is a good part in the decarbonization strategy. And at UPL, we have done, we have created green cell inside the UPL and that green cell reports to me and we support our global operation in bringing the new sustainable technology, embedding new or some best practices we found somewhere. Then we discuss with operation, implement it. Also, if operation needed, needed certain budget to implement certain technology, then we support them and we discuss with top management and get budget for them. So I think we should support operation technically and also to achieve this. So that is also a good practice which need to be happen. Uh, so I think uh, this is about our carbon and uh, decarbonization. I think when next round, uh, I will share more and more things regarding this. Uh, thank you, Chaube ji. Uh, I would request Giriji ji if you can add on this, whatever Dr. Chaube has said. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think a lot again has been shared by Dr. Chaube. But as far as Deepak Nitride is concerned, uh, since the question, your question was about uh, what is long term vision of uh, the company and how are we going to achieve the uh, net zero emissions? So, uh, in case of Deepak Nitride, our vision itself encompasses the concept of sustainability. And therefore, uh, the, uh, the 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 journey becomes much easier because culturally uh, it is widely accepted uh, uh, values value which we are we are talking about in this case. But more than that, I believe since the uh, if I again look at the uh, subject topic of the discussion, uh, the focus is here on net zero. And I see there, there seem to be a lot of uh, confusion with respect to the understanding people have about net zero and carbon neutrality. I am reading out certain uh, comments also from the uh, delegates who are talking about carbon credits and carbon capture and all. Uh, sorry, carbon credit, not cap, carbon capture. Now, in my opinion, of course, and I stand corrected, these two are different, completely different things. Uh, carbon um, uh, neutrality or carbon offset is not net zero. Net zero basically talks about cutting the emissions down to almost 90 percent. And the remaining, of course, will be to be captured in forest or oceans. And uh, it is to be recognized by a science based target mechanism which does not incidentally recognize the carbon offsetting or carbon credit. So that's a fundamental difference we need to all understand. Having said this, at Deepak Nitride, we are deploying three-pronged uh, 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 approach in achieving the sustainability um, objectives. Uh, so we uh, we operate at, uh, I mean, that is the focus is on R&D, the focus is on process and operations, and the uh, uh, focus is on, of course, uh, technology. In case of, uh, on a very broad scale, I would like to share certain examples. For example, in case of R&D, uh, green chemistry, of course, has been talked about a lot. And we are uh, working on oxidation platform with nitric acid. Now, a counter question can come out that how can nitric acid oxidation be more greener than, for example, air oxidation. But being in unique position we are, we have mastered the uh, art and technology to capture the NOx. And therefore, we are able to valorize those NOx. And that is how we are making use of the technology in our favor and also meeting the sustainability uh, targets. 
we are also at the plant level of course i think many uh, such initiatives have already been shared by uh, uh, dr choben of course mr sharma in the earlier uh, part also uh, every every live organization of course would be looking at those uh, or similar approaches right from uh, at an operational level going for uh, 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 more efficient agitators to boilers to pumps uh de deploying vfds and of course power optimizers at various and and opportune places to going for renewable energy and uh, as i said in the beginning we are already in the process of um, uh, going ahead with renewable energy for to the tune of 10 uh, megawatts for uh, both of our plants in 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 uh, in uh, maharashtra and gujarat which of course is going to add to the uh, uh, efforts and in the long term, as I said in the beginning, that uh, there can be a debate between profitability or sustainability or profitability versus sustainability. But as we move forward, I believe that debate will no more be valid. It will be only, uh, uh, I mean, profitability with sustainability would be the motto of every organization. Because unless and until an organization is not sustainable, it will not be profitable at all. So these are certain approaches we are uh, taking up in the night, right? And I will be happy to share more uh, certain relevant points if time permits. And of course, uh, with the permission of the organizer, uh, Praveen Ji Yu, and of course, the panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Girishi. Uh, now I come to uh, Snyder and uh, try to understand their vision after listening to all the uh, manufacturers. What's your vision and what's your roadmap? Uh, and how do you think Snyder will bring the impact towards sustainability? Yeah, so uh, Praveen, uh, thanks a lot for this question. You know, uh, I like what uh, Mr. Grish had talked about, sustainability is embedded into the overall purpose statement and mission statement of Schneider Electric. It is deeply into the DNA of our organization. Uh, because that's exactly what we do uh, as a company. Now, having said this, running our own enterprise across 100 plus countries, managing more than 250 plus manufacturing sites in a more sustainable way, in the most sustainable way is like, you know, eating your own food. We deploy all the best technologies that we have within our own enterprise to manage uh, everything very, very sustainably. Just to let you know, our net zero targets. Our net zero targets are uh, 2050. We will be net zero. I, I liked what uh, Grish uh, very well explained, the difference between neutrality and the net zero. So we are talking about net zero in terms of reducing the absolute emissions across the scope one, two, and three by 90% by 2050. And interestingly, there are also intermediary targets uh, over these coming years. 2030, we will reduce our emissions across the entire supply chain by 25%, and our operations will be almost net zero ready. So those are the two high level uh, targets for us, net zero. Again, these targets are all validated by SBTI. And what is interesting is we have uh, more than, let's say across the spectrum of ESG, there are more than 30 KPIs which are very well periodically managed uh, and not uh, like Dr. Chobe said, it is not once in a year for compliance and filing and disclosures, but it is part of the day-to-day -day operations management of the organization as much as sometimes, as much as, you know, incentivizing the whole leadership onto the result achieved on the sustainability KPIs. Uh, just to let you know, uh, most of our people in the company, variable salary is linked to the sustainability outcomes every year, which is discussed, reviewed every quarter with the leadership. So this is how we, we uh, run it uh, within the organization and uh, also setting the example for most of the stakeholders uh, walking the talk. Uh, so that's how we manage uh, Sustainability. We talked only about emissions, but there are other elements of SNG. Maybe we'll have discussions in some other forums. Very interesting stuff. Uh, we all are working towards that. And again, extremely relevant. 
uh, in this uh, current uh, situation in the world. So I'll stop here. Uh, Praveen, back to you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, the clock has already uh, is yeah. showing 4.31. I would request uh, uh, with support from all our speakers if we can extend it by 20 minutes more or uh, so that uh, we can also take the questions. I would request all my speakers for the third round if they can be short and precise. So I see a lot of questions there. And uh, so to, to start with, uh, now I would request uh, uh, Mr. K.K. Sharma ji to focus on uh, uh, organizations, organizations investing in R&D to develop sustainable alternatives to traditional chemicals, emerging technologies which will play a critical role in reducing carbon emissions in the chemical sector. So if you can focus on the technologies which you are focusing, sir. Over to Mr. Kikesh. It's a very, very, I think, interesting question also and uh, a challenge also right now because in chemical industry, how we are working, I think R&D is the backbone of any industry. So what we feel is the uh, some of the initiatives which are already implemented i'll just uh, um, have my discussion in two parts one is already implemented the certain projects like we are manufacturing right now alcohol which is uh, one of the product which is manufactured from molasses one of the byproduct from sugar industry so we produce almost to the tune of some capacity is 560 kiloliters per day i think in the chat window somebody asked also this alcohol is going for petrol blending that is something which ultimately is reducing uh, scope 3 emission in the downstream. But at the same time, this is the alcohol which after 10 years or maybe 6-7 years, right now I think uh, we are right now at 12.8% in terms of the blending and our target is by next year it will be somewhere around 15%. It's a very, very aspirational goal which uh, our Honorable Prime Minister has uh, already, I think, uh, driving. The thing is, once our... Uh, uh, Atmanirbhar uh, Bharat, uh, in terms of uh, setting up uh, various uh, oil uh, exploration projects are put in place. This alcohol, I feel, will be available for green manufacturing. That is something which can be converted into acetone, acetic acid, acetic anhydride, and all these can further be converted into diethyl ether. And I think this is what is the endeavor in the times to come, where industries have to be ready, future ready in terms of implementing those projects. This is one project which is already now in place. And the second one is uh, in terms of potassium sulfate. This is another, I think, uh, soil uh, nutrient which is uh, right now being imported. And happy to share with you, this is uh, one of its own kind. We are globally the first company to manufacture this product uh, recently, last year onwards. This was implemented where slop fired boiler ash ultimately is something which is having this potash and we have put up this plant in consultation with ICMR and uh, that's how this potassium sulfate is now in the market in terms of uh, the product which is available. That's uh, one. Then uh, comes uh, bagasse is something which we are already utilizing uh, in our uh, captive power plant in sugar where we produce to the tune of some 170 megawatt and whatever excess is there, uh, it is uh, fed to the state grid. But having said that, this bagasse is something which is very, very useful and R&D uh, efforts are being put in terms of uh, utilizing this bagasse for value added, which is something like ligonin, which can be made use into various uh, value added products. That's uh, one where the research is going on. And uh, there is already, I think, a collaborative uh, effort in terms of recently we have uh, collaborated our engagement with the ICT which earlier was uh, UDCT, where a uh, lot of uh, effort is being put on decarbonization projects, whereby not only utilizing uh, CO2, which is uh, being captured uh, in terms of uh, utilizing it for gainful utilization in terms of making polycarbonates and all, but at the same time, we have already implemented one in-house research uh, almost one and a half year back at our Kota facility where CO2 from the cement plant is captured and it is used for conversion, carbonation. That is some lime sludge is there, which is calcium hydroxide. It's a basic chemistry where the calcium hydroxide is getting converted through this carbon dioxide, which is captured from the stack. That's how it is converted into calcium carbonate, which is used for cement and thereby we are reducing our uh, fresh utilization of uh, lime, that is calcium oxide for cement manufacturing. That ultimately results in almost to the tune of some uh, 50,000 tons of uh, CO2 emission. 
so these are few i think efforts which are on continual basis making it very very clear that uh, unless we do deep research in terms of various uh, actions in terms of not only identifying the opportunity but at the same time contributing towards uh, ghg emission reduction and last but not the least there is already now a plant which is under erection where uh, this uh, bcg bio compressed gas is being uh, it will be manufactured or you can say will be generated from the press mud which is again one of its own kind in the country where this press mud will be utilized utilized for uh, biogas uh, uh, this generation compressed biogas which will be substituted for uh, our uh, cng these these are the few i think examples which should give you an idea that unless we focus on this rnd on continual basis the net zero journey is something uh, which has to be done in terms of the continual process thank, thank you, you very much uh, thank you sir for elaborating it uh, for our audience uh, next uh, question is to dr mrutunjay chobe ji what initiatives your company has done in terms of promoting recycling and waste reduction in chemical production and the challenges are encountered in decarbonizing the company supply chain and how have you addressed them i request sir for your short answers so that uh, we can take up at least four three four questions and then uh, we do the concluding remarks over to you sir all right so uh, i think for uh, recycle reuse and uh, minimizing the waste that is our very important uh, strategy and uh, we are right now pursuing inside our organization and uh, just to give you how much it has been done you can get with one data which we have published in sustainability report as well last four year we reduce 52% uh, this waste disposal going outside so a lot of things we have done where we can reuse recycle our product inside our premises but uh, more than that in chemical industry uh, while producing a product we get certain by product and several times those by products go for disposing to landfill side we found that uh, a lot of usage happen inside the other industry and those things we have promoted and a lot of by product which get produced at our premises we find usage in other industry and send them and get it used so by that way we minimize the waste disposal to landfill sites here one important thing i want to mention that our experience is that the uh, government should also play very important role in uh, in encouraging circularity today if you see our uh, uh, hazardous waste management act 2016 so that is a act which has been made by moef to promote the circular economy uh, and uh, also prevent the misuse of disposal of hazardous waste <laughs> but recently uh, two three year back they have inserted rule in and today if you discuss inside the industry then this rule 9 under the uh, 2016 uh, hazardous waste management act it is a bottleneck because under rule 9 if you want to send by product to different industry for the reuse recycle you have to first make sop and that sop should be jointly approved with the central pollution control board of ecl and the state pollution control board of ecl so they visit uh-huh. in your plant and the joint demonstration happen and then only that sop get approved unless until your sop get approved under rule 9 you cannot send and today a lot of sops are lying there it's became very very difficult that at same time cpcb official and the state pollution control board official both come for the joint demonstration so i think our request is even from industry uh, we have sent memorandum and request to ministry of environment forest that look into it because instead of increasing the circularity reuse recycle this rule 9 is a bottleneck for the industry 
<laughs> so I think uh, we need to focus there also that our regulation should be such that the people can easily um, enhance and also reuse recycle. A part of this uh, to our um, UPL, I think uh, we are doing uh, uh, several uh, good things, several initiatives we are taking to reduce the uh, waste as well as hazardous waste, as well as wastewater that also we are finding many more reuse and the recycle. So uh, this is about uh, this uh, waste recycle. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chauvin. Uh, now I come to Giriji. Uh, sir, uh, when you are looking at uh, the entire workforce, it's not easy to uh, engage and educate uh, the company's workforce uh, to focus or navigate in the path to net zero. So what are the things that uh, Deepak Group is doing to see, see to it that each and every employee contributes to uh, uh, in terms of navigating the path to net zero? So over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. I believe this is one of the most important question which probably may not get discussed. Because generally we talk about the, the sustainability, net zero, carbon uh, neutrality and all this uh, at a at a, a leadership level or a board level. But we cannot bring the transformational change with respect to our approach if we do not really engage our uh, workforce. And therefore, we actually uh, pay a lot of attention towards this aspect in Deepak Knight, right? We, uh, by means of, for example, PCF, that is uh, um, product carbon footprints, the LCA, lean supply chain, utility consumption per ton basis, reduction in, uh, in, in utilities. Indirectly, of course, talk about uh, these initiatives which impact all scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions with our workforce. Secondly, we also encourage the uh, culture of ideation. We run the uh, uh, campaign at our sites from time to time, and we call it as IPL, that is Ideation Premier League, where we, in fact, encourage uh, the uh, ideas bouncing uh, out of the uh, every level of the uh, uh, workforce. And once that exercise is being done, we actually then create a CFT that is cross-functional team because unless and until there is a complete buying in from various uh, functions to implement a very brilliant idea, which can, which otherwise can get killed, it will not get implemented uh, properly. So we encourage the culture of CFT and uh, uh, translate those uh, brilliant ideas which come from the grassroots to the uh, four. So this is something which we do. We also encourage the uh, uh, um, outside, uh, uh, out of the box thinking at our uh, work, work, work uh, places and announce the sort of a spontaneous award on month to month basis, which is, which is given by the site head or by the um, uh, director of the company. So just to send a message that we value the uh, 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 the the ingenuity of the people who can contribute, however small that idea could be. And that is how we actually bring that uh, cultural, we try to bring that cultural change, which I'm sure will really help us to implement a larger idea about the net zero mission. So this is how, uh, in brief, we take the journey through the night right uh thank you sir uh, now i come to the last question and this is to uh mr venkat garimela snyder has something called uh, sustainability lighthouse factories uh so how do you see this being replicated uh, uh, uh so that uh, uh, the companies or chemical companies and petrochemical companies can create lighthouse factories so your views uh, short views sir and then we will take sure. up Q&A. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you, uh, Praveen, for this question. Uh, that's right. Uh, last year, one of our factories, uh, <laughs> which is located in Hyderabad, was recognized as Lighthouse for Sustainability by World Economic Forum. Uh, in fact, this was the second recognition. Uh, the year before, the recognition was for end-to-end -end lighthouse uh, by World Economic Forum. Now, you know, these recognitions are good, but I think what is more interesting, which I want to share with everyone is, uh, what have we achieved in terms of sustainability by deploying the technology and overall bringing in the transformation of mindsets, operation, 
processes and also onboarding our other, our suppliers and all the other ecosystem members our energy consumption uh, per unit reduced by 52% over 4 years base year was 2019 and the results that i'm talking about we achieved in 2022 so over these 4 years energy consumption reduced by 52% water consumption reduced by 57% and our uh, waste uh, also reduced significantly by 50% and all in all emissions scope 1 and 2 also reduced by 61%. It sounds so good, right? And frankly, for any ROI discussions, this is uh, a red carpet. Yeah, these things of uh, these results are a big welcome. This is exactly is the power of uh, technology. And the same technology that we have been discussing, all my esteemed panelists have been talking about, how do you have the best level of efficiency of processes, resources, energy on one side, and how do we induce the whole digital ecosystem in the operations, right? So this is exactly what we did. Again, walk the talk for us, and uh, uh, we'll be more than happy to host any of you uh, and to take you through the real uh, experience of how these things are all being done. And by the way, this factory was a brownfield retrofit use case. This is more than 18, 20 years old. And our lighthouse journey started about uh, seven, eight years. So even your existing plant, uh, existing manufacturing setup can be retrofitted, can produce substantial results deploying technology. And by the way, a very, very strong ROI. Just to let you know, in terms of ROI, we, as such as Schneider, don't undertake any transformation projects if the ROI is more than two years. Huh? So, so those are the strict ROI guidelines that we have, and we, we uh, very well executed this. So this is, in short, the story of Lighthouse. There are only two uh, Lighthouse, uh, WEF Lighthouse in India, uh, uh, and uh, we are one of them. So uh, most welcome for any one of you, or maybe if you want a detailed conversation of what does it take to get to these results, we'll be more than happy to have a, a online or even face-to-face -face, uh, meeting at Hyderabad side. So that's all, uh, Praveen, uh, from my side, uh, back to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we will take uh, one question for each of our panelists. Uh, there will be two questions for uh, Dr. Chaubeji, uh, because there is only one short uh, answer. Uh, for the first one. Uh, 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 the question is uh, from Mr. Vishal Dalvi, and he's asking uh, Mirtunjay Chobe, sir, uh, the tracker alarm that, uh, that you talked about, have you automated data capturing on an hourly basis or daily basis? So, uh, alarm is on monthly basis. Um, we, we capture online. So, capture happen always, but we, we send the alarm on monthly basis. Okay, and uh, and the second is from Mr. Prakash Bondre. By using cooling tower in our manufacturing process, we are uh, losing a lot of energy and also impacting the environment. Would you like would like to know is there any option to use the energy and avoid cooling tower? Your short answer, sir. So cooling tower, we we have installed one technology called a scale van technology. So what there we did, we achieved the recycle of the same water even on higher TDS. So even on up to 2 lakh ppm TDS, we recycled by using the scale van technology. And by that way, we reduced a lot of water use and the energy consumption also. Um, but I think a part of many more ideas are there in cooling tower. And one important point is that um, it's consume a lot of water and energy uh, as far as the utility is concerned. So uh, I think uh, it will take much more time if we uh, start discussing all the idea. But one yeah. example I have given that a scale van technology we have used and a lot of advantage we found. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Girishi, uh, uh, the question is, uh, uh, I don't know the, who the name is, but I'm reading the question for you, sir. We would like to know your views about global carbon pricing or green balance mechanism, which will allow a level playing field for companies like yours who are actively investing in sustainability to play in a market that is riddled with other players who aren't investing as actively as you. So your views, sir? So uh, I believe the carbon pricing is uh, something which is uh, ranging between 40 to $80 per ton. 
And uh, there is a debate about it, whether this is the right pricing or not. Uh, but as I said in the beginning, that uh, if we talk about the net zero mission, probably this is not the uh, right way forward because a lot of greenwashing happen, happens during this carbon trading, uh, carbon credit business because it is beyond your value chain. And therefore, you are really not sure as to whether you are buying these carbon credits are really uh, the right ones or they are, they are genuinely um, available in the market. So this is something which is a, a very touchy subject and one need to have a deeper understanding about it before really embarking on it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Jain Kumar is asking question to Mr. K.K. Sharma. Most of the RMs in chemical plants are crude oil based and therefore already have a lot of carbon footprint associated with them. Biofuels or biomaterial is still in nation stage and also inadequate to meet demand. Example, ethanol blending in petrol. Your comment, sir. I think I have already answered. It is the time which will drive the uh, green products. That is something which is uh, uh, we are going to see in future. The green chemistry is something which chemical industry have to adopt. That's what I shared. And in terms of alcohol, right now it is being used for petrol blending. But certainly that time will come when this alcohol will be made available for uh, gainful uh, utilization for making chemicals. I think presently, uh, certainly the option option of those uh, green uh, raw materials are not easily available. But certainly in terms of, as already mentioned by Mr. Satarkar, it is the sustainable products which will ultimately be the profitable products. That's the ultimate key. One last question to uh, Mr. Venkat Garimela. Uh, it is from Rajni Chavan. How do MNCs incentivize the supply chain partners, especially in the MSME sector, to adopt sustainable practices? Yeah, I think it's a very valid question. And in the whole conversation of net zero, uh, supply chain stakeholders are super critical. We saw in the chemical industry, uh, scope three, which is the supply chain contribution, emissions are as high as 50%. For us, actually it is much higher than that. So engaging supply chain partners is very critical and they are of varied size, scale, disbursement, and uh, context, right? The question is, do we incentivize? Actually, what we do, I'll tell you our own practice of how we have been working on supply chain decarbonization initiatives. What we do is we bring to the table all the enablers, know-how, the technology, skilling up, capacity building. This is what we do, right? We do not subsidize, give incentives of any sorts because you know what? The supply chain members have to understand that this is only short-lived. I can only give only that much of incentives. I can only give that much of uh, uh, financial support. So it is important for them to really understand what this will dry in their organization, however small it is, and how they can reap benefits over a sustained period of time. And for that, they have to be remain. They have to remain invested with their own resources, with their own capital. Uh, so this is our strategy. This is how I've been approached. And we have been fairly successful. Of course, there are learnings. There are uh, different situations at different times. Some MSME stakeholders get onto this uh, program early. Some don't get onto the program that early. But eventually, in incentivization is not the great way to get them on board. This is uh, my feeling based on my experience. Uh, and by the way, as we also discussed, sustainability is definitely a great business case. The ROI sometimes is in short term, but ROI sometimes also is in long term, right? There are no two ways about it. There is always a return on investment on sustainability. It is the lens that you wear to measure when and how. So I'll stop here. Uh, more conversations. I'll welcome if anyone wants to reach out to me. I have my coordinates and we'll take this forward. So uh, let me thank. Uh, I think uh, we had to extend it by 25 minutes and I think it will go till another five minutes. Uh, let me thank uh, all my speakers, all my esteemed speakers. Uh, uh, and special thanks to uh, Mr. K.K. Sharmaji. Despite uh, having fever and throat infection, he was here, sir. Uh, uh, many thanks, sir, for... Uh, Educating us a big clap uh, to KK Sharmaji and all our other speakers. 
मिस्टर गिरीश शंकर एग्जीक्यूटिव डायरेक्टर दीपक नाइट्राइट लिमिटेड मिस्टर के के शर्मा होल टाइम डायरेक्टर ई एच एस डी सी एम श्रीराम लिमिटेड डॉक्टर मृत्युंजय चौबे विथ हिज एक्सपर्टीज हैव ऑल्सो एजुकेटेड अस इन अ बिग वे ग्लोबल वी पी एनवायरमेंट एंड सस्टेनेबिलिटी यूनियन लिमिटेड आई ऑलवेज एम ईगर टू लिसन टू हिज एक्सपर्टीज ऑन सस्टेनेबिलिटी मिस्टर ज्ञान लूका मरोला ग्लोबल बिजनेस डेवलपमेंट फॉर स्पेशलिटी केमिकल्स स्नाइडर इलेक्ट्रिक he also comes from the startup world and uh, and also uh, uh, enriched uh, into the snider electric uh, company mr venkat garimela vice president strategy and sustainability snider electric india mr rohit kasta sustainability business leader snider electric india and and before i thank uh, all the delegates let me uh, announce the winners for today's uh, 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 Mm, quiz uh, ic and play and win contest the first answer was uh, is an a which is energy efficiency electrification use of renewables and the winner is nirant so son son gaukar from deepak kamte so deepak group would be very happy girish ji would be happy sir and then uh, the second answer the second question the answer is around 15% and this has come from uh, ey which is tushar tamhane so congratulations tushar for this the third is uh, uh, the answer was a uh, already now on many process and heat transfer operations and uh, yash jankaria from toyo engineering india private limited so what we see here is so uh, it is equally divided three of us one from the chemical sector another from the consultant and the third from the vendor community so let me thank all the our delegates who participated in this e conference those who were not able to participate can view the recorded version on indian chemical news website we will also carry the text uh, version of uh, after transcribing all the, the speakers who spoke and uh, put it on our website and then uh, 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 then deliver it to our 49000 odd uh, uh, newsletter database that we do have uh, let me also thank our uh, partner uh uh snider electric for supporting us in this uh, net zero conference let me also thank uh, icn team members for making this a success uh those who have not filled up uh, the 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 microsoft uh, form i would request if you can do so it would be helpful for the snider team to get your views and then come back to you uh with this uh, i now thank uh, uh, everyone uh, once again i am uh, praveen prashant uh, signing off uh, to meet again on 28th august with a new topic till then namaste and goodbye jai hind